Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on Forgotten Weapons. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the James D. Julia Auction House in beautiful rural Maine, taking a look at some of the guns they have coming up for sale in their March 2015 auction. Now there are a bunch of guns here that are from the collection of Dr. Jeffrey Sturgis, who was a preeminent collector of interesting and unusual early handguns. One in particular here is a PPR patent 45 caliber pistol. This was made for US military trials, which it did very poorly in. Um, I've been unable so far to find any records of the, the actual trials. Um, suffice to say this obviously did not get accepted by anybody, but it's a really interesting prototype pistol to take a look at. Now, the name PPR comes up quite a bit uh, in European pistols. This was actually, uh, it was a company founded by Henri PPR in 1866 as a, a fairly large gun manufacturing concern in Liège, Belgium. Uh, manufactured all sorts of different things and ultimately went on to be one of the founding partners of FN, Fabrique Nationale. Now one of Henri's sons was named uh, Nicolas and he went off on his own. Frankly, PP, the, the main company had some financial trouble and, and the sons weren't really all that well set up for their own futures and they set up, they set off on their own, developed their own companies. Well, Nicolas was a gunsmith and, and manufacturer set up his own company, and one of the guns that he patented was actually licensed out for manufacture by Steyr as the Model 1908 or Model 1909. These were little pocket pistols that looked kind of like a small version of this. Um, they, were, they copied some elements of the Browning 1900 in that they had a recoil spring over the top and a barrel underneath. Uh, they were manufactured in 25 and 32 caliber, or for you Europeans out there, 6.35 and 7.65 millimeter. They weren't unknown. You know, they're still out there. You can find them, um, but they're fairly uncommon pistols. These were manufactured from 1908 until 1914, and then in some quantity as well after World War I. They have some interesting features, which I'm not going to get into because we can look at those same interesting features on this one, made in 45. All right, well, trials pistols always catch my attention. and This one was no different. It is 45 caliber. It is straight blowback. We have our bolt here. You can see, as I mentioned, the barrels on the bottom, the recoil springs on the top. In fact, what's more interesting is it is a compression recoil spring up here with a guide rod running down the middle of it. So when I cock the action, you can see the bolt opens up there, and we have this naked guide rod up top because the spring is being compressed inside this spring tube where we can't see it. If you wanted to have access to the spring, you would use a split screwdriver and take out this nut, and it would be inside there. Now, this is how you would charge the pistol Look inside. What is particularly interesting on this is that it has no extractor. So if you want to remove a case from the chamber, whether it was a misfire or simply you want to stop shooting before you fired all of your ammunition, you use this lever on the left side of the gun, which allows you to tilt the barrel up. From there, you have access to the barrel. You can pull a cartridge out. If you look at the front of the bolt, right there, you can see that there is, in fact, no extractor to be found. Very unusual. A lot of people don't realize that blowback pistols don't actually really need the extractor to properly extract and eject cases, but it gets kind of essential when you decide that you want to take an unfired case out of the chamber. So there aren't very many pistols out there that deliberately don't have extractors, but this is one of them. Now the bolt itself, what's interesting to note, when the barrel's up, there is no spring tension on the bolt. And in fact, it can go forward and backward. The reason for that is that this is the extension of the spring guide. Pull it back here under spring tension. And it's got a little hook at the end of it where we have a little round piece inside there that catches on this recoil spring hook. So that's what actually provides the motive force to the bolt. Now to fully disassemble this, you would take this screw out, which would allow you to remove the barrel assembly. That screw's in there pretty tight and I don't want to poke at it too hard. So I'm going to leave the bolt, I'm going to leave the barrels in place. However, we can still pull the bolt most of the way forward here. You can get a better feel for what it looks like right there. So it's on this slide connected to the rear sight, which runs in a set of rails on the top of the receiver. 
if we look down inside there, the light's a little dark, but you can see the back of a hammer. This is a hammer-fired gun. Um, it's just a, a fully shrouded hammer. And on the back of the bolt, we have this right in there. That big round thing is the firing pin. Again, you can see that there's no extractor in there. So to put this back together, we just put the bolt in the middle, pull the lever down, lock the barrels in place, lever goes up, that hooks the barrels securely where they are. The gun's ready to go again, just like that. Now the magazine is another kind of interesting element. It's a little strong. First off, the magazine is kind of interesting looking here. It has a big long tail coming out the back of the magazine. Other than that, it looks kind of like a standard 1911 magazine, which would make sense given that this was a trials gun based on the exact same 45 caliber cartridge. There's our magazine catch groove. Now the neat thing about this, this is a kind of clever idea. When you pull down the magazine tab, the catch, you go to there, and you keep pushing, and what it does is unlock the magazine and also push it the first little bit out of the magazine well. Your thumb is then there in a position to pull the magazine right out. This one is quite tight. We have a few markings of interest here. We have N, that's Nicolas Pipiard patent. And then if you look very closely, you can see Belgian proof marks. The 8B there is one of the import marks that was unfortunately required on this pistol. We have some more Belgian proof marks right up here on the top of the slide. You can see from left to right, the first mark is called a Perron. That is a, a stamp resembling a famous uh, monument in Belgium. Then a star over B and the PV mark. So those are typical Belgian proof marks from the period. Niter blued rear sight, it's kind of neat. It just dovetailed into the slide. And then the front sight is just pretty typical for the period, a little blade. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. So it's certainly a, kind of a, a once in a lifetime chance to take a look at a pistol like this. Unless, of course, you'd like to own it permanently, which you can certainly do. This is for sale at the Julia Auction in March 2015. It is lot 2231. And if you take a look at the link below, you can jump over to Julia's catalog, where you can take a look at their high-res pictures, read their description, basically get all the info you need to know to set up an account and place a bid if you'd like to add this to your own collection of U.S. Trials 45 caliber pistols. Thanks for watching, and good luck.